Acts 1, 1 through 15. At this time, Peter stood among the brothers and sisters. A group of about 120 people were there together and said. So at this point, while all the disciples were leaders, Peter takes initiative here to speak. I don't think that this meant Peter was the head of the church because Christ is the head of the church. But Peter, we see through the rest of Acts and New Testament that Peter and John and James, they were the key disciples. So they were maybe one step above because of the inner circle thing. I don't think Peter was ahead of James or John. There may have been equality among them because they were Jesus' inner circle. So the 120 here, this includes the disciples. Um, we see one point in the New Testament, and I'm going to mention this because I'll come back to this point, that Jesus sends them out, the 12 out in six groups of two, to tell them that he's come, and they're, they would go out just in to the Jews in that area. And kind of bring the Jews to Jesus. Let them know. And this 120 most likely came from that first evangelistic movement. So, verse 16. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrest Jesus. So, Peter here kind of, cuts the tension, addresses the thing that ain't really comfortable addressing, Judas. Peter just kind of is like, yeah, Peter would have probably boldly just said, yeah, bad things happen, but are you trusting the Lord to do good out of it? That type of statement, and that's kind of how he's going with this. Yeah, the thing Judas did was horrible, but it had to be done. As a fulfillment of scripture. And Jesus had to be arrested. Acceptance. Because of God's greater good. In fact in a way he may be forgiving. Not holding guilt to Judas. And more allowing that to fall to God as it should. Verse 17. For he count, was counted among us and received his share of in this ministry. That's where I want to go back to the idea of these going out in groups of six, groups of two, six groups of two. Judas would have been one of them that went out. Judas, and, and it talks about going out, working miracles, doing things. Judas would have done that. Judas may have went out and cast out demons. Judas definitely witnessed things like the feeding of the thousands, just as Peter did. Witnessed the raising of the Lazarus, just as Peter did. While Peter was very likely, almost guaranteed, uh, this through Scripture, almost uh, almost guaranteed, Peter would have been a disciple before Judas. We don't know exactly when Judas came, but it's likely after Peter, James, and John, some point after. We don't know how long after, but it would have been not long enough to where he wouldn't have seen anything because Jesus was working miracles the whole time. Uh, well, not the whole time. There's a point where he stops working miracles because they're hard hearts and just teaches. But either way, I don't think Judas came along after when he was just teaching. He would have been there the whole time. Enough of the time to really grasp who Jesus was. But he didn't have the same heart as Peter. Verse 18. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle. And all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all residents of Jerusalem as a result that the field was called Hakadama, in their own language, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, 
I believe all this is referenced from Psalms. May his residence be made desolate, and may there be none living in it, and there may there may another take his office. Now, I'll deal with more about taking his office next week. Um, but let's deal with this. Many people think it's contra contradiction in Scripture, what it says here, with what it says in the Gospels about Judas hanging himself. I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction. It doesn't say he died from falling headlong. This may be a little disturbing, so I'm not going to be too graphic about it, but if a body is just left hanging, nature takes its course, and this could happen as it's decomposing. It's likely because of all the chaos at that time and the heat of that climate that Judas's body just hung there until this happened and nature took its course. We also see in the New Testament how the they buy he clearly has no heirs. He, he uses the blood money that he betrayed Jesus with to buy this field, and because he has no the they take kind of take it back and kind of bury foreigners and stuff there. But we see the curse here that, yeah, might as well because nothing was going to grow in it. It was worthless land. So, I, I do want to bring up a distinction before I go into this about prior. So, we see what happens here with Judas. He hangs himself. He dies. Um, but we see what's happening here with Peter. He's becoming the leader God, Jesus, intended for him to be. So we see the distinction there. So this kind of gets into the topic I want to talk about. When conflict comes, we can be like Judas or we can be like Peter. Let's look more deeply at Judas here. Judas sought greedy and fleshly desires. We see how he betrayed Jesus for what would have commonly be seen as the price you give for a slave. Honestly. It wasn't a lot. Um, in eternity aspect, it may have seen a lot at the time for him, but it is still greed. And there's some things you just don't sell. The Lord is one of them. Let's look at some scripture. Ecclesiastes 5.10 The one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. Judas may have been cheat. We, we see, and I believe it's John, refers to how he would occasionally steal from the money bag. He was the holder of it, and he'd occasionally steal from it. Greed's never satisfied. He was with them. He stole from it. What exactly did he do with it? Not to be caught. Probably nothing. He just wanted to know he had it. There's no sense in it. 1 John 2.16 For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust, and the pride of one's possessions is not from the Father, but from this world. So we see how the lead up of what, and we see in John how Judas opens himself up to demon possession in it, receiving Satan, if you will. Um, I believe it says even possessed by Satan in a moment. Um, but he kind of opens himself up to that. Uh, Judas didn't, wasn't, no. He was definitely seeking things of this world. The worldly desires, fleshly desires. 
Um, um, Judas talk fusses when, yeah, won't move on. Hebrews thirteen five. Keep your lot of free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, "I will never leave you or abandon you." Judas shouldn't have been worried about money. He had Jesus with him. Now, ultimately, it's to fulfill Scripture, and we ain't going to neglect that. But we're going to look at the errors from Judas to where we can elaborate and be like, okay, let's not be like that. We need to be content with the Lord. Luke twelve fifteen, He told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in abundance of his possession. So stay guarded. Greed can overtake us. The things of this flesh can overtake us if we don't keep guard at them, if we don't be diligent in our relationship with him. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: Anyone trusting in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Um, so, we see how righteous here are abundant. Proverbs thirteen eleven. Wealth obtained by fraud with dwindle, will dwindle, but whoever earns it through the labor will multiply it. So we see how Judas gained this money through betraying Jesus, not an honest means. And how ultimately the money he is so greedy for, he no longer wanted. It's important to note... Judas may have felt shame and guilt, which are often tools of the enemy, but he never he was never convicted and he never repented. Because if he did, he wouldn't have hung himself. Point two, Jesus, Judas, Judas wanted the earthly kingdom. Jesus often talked about how his kingdom wasn't of this world. I believe Judas wanted it to be. And oftentimes we can lead in that way too when we don't need to. First John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of one's possession, is not of the Father, but is from the world. The world with its lust is passing away, but no, but the one who does will remain remains forever. Yeah, I covered that one verse twice. I just now realize that. Uh, okay. Either way, that's fine. Um, so we, we we see one verse there, just pointing how Judas probably was not kingdom minded. He 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 was content, not with what Jesus said, but he wanted. Jesus to be king of the world almost maybe but I'm sure it was more focused on if Jesus was this what would it make Judas because ultimately the selfishness of him Ephesians 2 2 in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world according to the ruler of the power of the air the spirit now working in disobedience we see how Judas in the Gospel of John received his spirit rather than 
walking with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know the Holy Spirit hadn't been given yet, but still, he should have been walking out the ways God had told him. James 1.13 No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. I wanted to cover this right here, because... Well, it was in Scripture, so Jesus called Judas, calls Judas, God calls Judas to betray him. No, we have a free will to sin. God's plan is greater than it, and His plan can acknowledge it and bring good out of it, and that's exactly what happened. God did not tempt Judas. The devil did. He wasn't tempted by God, but God was greater than the temptation of that he had. So he could work it all out according to his plan. Know that you falling to temptation doesn't mean God is done with you. There's hope in that. I hope that Judas didn't understand. But don't ever think because you fall to temptation and God can make good from it. That God causes evil. Because he don't. The idea, and I want to cover it here. Why do does God let good th- bad things happen to good people? Truly, none of us are good. We see that in scripture. And we're blessed that God allows good things to happen to us. Because we don't deserve any of it. Okay. Point number three. I kind of alluded to this already. Judas Judas chose to die without repenting. Uh, uh, Yeah, I already talked about that. Yeah, Judas went to the priests. try to undo what he did which rejected the understanding of God's plan none of them had the understanding of what God's plan was so that's understandable but when the priests and scribes and all the people he kind of gave money to Pharisees, Sadducees, all of them he gave up he he felt convicted. He felt guilt, but no conviction, no repentance. Hebrews nine twenty seven. Just as it is appointed for people to die once, after this there is judgment. So so we're going in the lines. Yes, we need to repent because there's judgment. We have reason to. First, uh, no, not first. John twelve forty eight. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken with all spoken will judge him. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So we see how we're judged by God's word. And whether we accept him or not. Accept Christ or not, I should say. Second Peter three seven. Three, seven. In the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire. And fire is often seen as the presence of God, but also seen as his ju- wrath. Being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Jude 15. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way, and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. We see a lot of ungodly in that verse. God isn't going to allow unrepentance. If we're not repentant, we face judgment that none of us want to have. So now let's look at the differences. Let's look at Peter. Peter found forgiveness in Christ. 
uh, we, we see how Peter didn't betray Jesus. But he did deny him three times and he deserted him. So while Peter didn't have it as... Didn't do maybe as we see as horrible as John uh, as Judas. He, he don't get off scots free either. But the fact is, he w went before Jesus afterwards for the forgiveness, and that would be used to radically change Peter. First John one nine, if we confess our sins. Confession, not just guilt. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Going to Him, not some fallen order of priests that He came to do away with to begin with. Uh, James five fifteen, the prayer of, the, of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So we see how, why, and we see G Peter was forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption, this is th in Jesus, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Peter could truly receive forgiveness. And it means something fully because Jesus had already shed his blood. Uh, before Jesus, those Jesus had forgiven, it was a forgiveness that looked ahead because he was going to die for their sins. He could forgive them. But at this point, it was like, I've already died for your sins. You're forgiven. So it was a little different. It, it was kind of Looking back at the cross instead of ahead. More of a place where we're at now. When Peter was forgiven. Peter. The second point. Peter became a building. Came. Sorry. Peter became about building the church. For the heavenly kingdom. So kind of kingdom minded. If you will. Where Judas was earthly minded. Uh, Matthew 6.33, love this verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you for you. Um, after the crucifixion, we see, I believe it's in John, how they go back fishing. Because it, they've been following him for three years, but he ain't there no more, top attitude. But as soon as Jesus comes back on the scene, they just, nah, we don't need to do this. And they knew they didn't need to do that. Because it wasn't all for nothing. And they could see that. Because they were kingdom minded. And we see here how Ju Peter's speaking about Judas. To bring a healing to the church so that it may move past it and grow. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexual immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. We can't live as this world and claim to be kingdom minded. We can't live as the world and be about be building the church. We got to have that change. We got to die to self. We got to be different. And Peter was definitely different at this point. It's likely that Peter had growth over time. But Judas is more a decline. He may have got, or, or stagnant. He may have flatlined his Christian walk rather than going up 
there was points where Peter dipped down, but there was movement, and Judas probably the same person he was when he met Jesus as when this happened. We need to have growth. We don't need to be dealing with the same struggles as we did constantly. There should be movement. There should be the Spirit working in us. Um, Matthew seven twenty one and tw- through twenty three. Do not not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not, did didn't we profess in your name, drive out demons in your name, do miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. It's very likely that Judas could have been one of the first people to actually be able to make this claim. Lord, Lord, didn't I do miracles in your name, cast out demons in your name, prophesy in your name? And the Lord saying, I don't know you. And of course, Judas wouldn't want to mention the fact that he betrayed him. And it ain't like Jesus wouldn't know him. Not really. But the intimacy was never there as he never submitted to him. And this isn't something we want to be have said to us. We can't be about this age anymore. We've got to be about him. Second Peter. Peter speaking himself up here. One... Second Peter one ten through eleven. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to conform, confirm, to confirm your calling and election. Live for the Lord is what that statement is talking about. Living out for the Lord, the fruit, the growth. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom kingdom of heaven of our lord and savior jesus christ will be richly provided for you so we got to live a life worthy uh, live a life walk worthy of the calling which is a life submitted to him if you're trying to live that life worthy apart from truly submitting to christ you're not living that life you're living a life like judas it's by submission and denial humbling ourselves and submitting to him that we have that and third point we're going to go in a little more tradition here with this peter would die for the lord we see in the new testament how peter would claim that he is ready to die for the lord and jesus response and i'm not quoting here was, yes, but you're not ready to do that yet. Alluding to the fact that Peter would die for the Lord. Tradition, and we'll get into this, get into that in a minute. Uh, Romans 14, 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. It's kind of how Peter... Yeah, I know that's Paul saying that, but that's kind of the way Peter's life spoke. Now we're going to get into tradition here. Peter would die, tradition shows Peter would die upside down on a cross for his faith in Jesus. Um, We can... Uh, there ain't no point arguing why he chose to do that. There ain't no point. In fact, is we see in the New Testament itself, Peter saying that he died, and Jesus would be like, "Yes, but not now. Yes, you will, but not now." So Peter, Jesus himself in Scripture says that Peter would die for him. And I, I wish I would have jotted where that verse was down, but I didn't. So the question is. Are you living for self like Judas or for Christ like Peter? 